everybody, time for another Evercade review. This time it's in Television Collection 1, which as always comes with a nice full color manual, even has a page dedicated to little bits of uh, tidbits and trivia on the Intellivision itself, but every other game gets at least a page of coverage. Really dig these manuals. Let's go ahead and take the Intellivision Collection 1, pop it in my VS, and see how the games hold up today. Let's go to the games. Intellivision Collection 1 is cartridge 21 of the Red Box series. Best Buy, which had it in at the standard $19.99 price at the time of my research, gives it a release date of January 14, 2022. It was also included in the Evercade VS Founder Edition System Bundle. Interestingly, this game was licensed by Intellivision Entertainment, the new Intellivision company that was formed to bring the Intellivision Amico to market, but so far has failed to do so, making this possibly the only collection of games tied to Intellivision Entertainment that has actually made it to retail since its inception, although a second collection is supposed to come out for the Evercade this summer. Naturally, retro gamers may wonder how the Intellivision keypad was incorporated into this collection. To access the keypad, you use the L or R shoulder buttons and the D-pad to select a number and the A button to press the selected number. Once the number is pressed, the Y button can be used to activate that number without repeating the entire process. It's a bit clumsy and there's no overlay shown, but thankfully most games included don't really rely a lot on the keypad. And the manual tells you how to use the keypad to start games selecting the variation you want. The manual also says that the select button can be used to switch which controller is number one, as in some games, the second controller was used for the first player. This cartridge contains the following 12 games, with the years given from the manual. The first game is 1981's Astro Smash, a top seller for the system and considered a classic by many. Astro Smash has you blasting asteroids, spinners, and guided missiles. You gain points blasting objects, but you lose points when asteroids hit the ground. It's enjoyable, but personally I find the game a little overrated. The second game is 1983's Buzz Bombers. Borrowing heavily from Centipede, you shoot bees with your spray can, which you turn into honeycombs that can be eaten by hummingbirds for bonus points. Your can has a limited amount of sprays in it, so you can't just shoot endlessly. There's a small learning curve, but the game is decent once you get used to it. The third game is 1982's Frog Bog. Your goal is to jump from pad to pad trying to eat the most bugs. It can be played alone, but it's truly made for two players. It's a simple yet enjoyable addition to this collection. The fourth game is 1982's Night Stalker, perhaps the most beloved game of this collection. In it, you're in a maze facing off against robots, spiders, and the most annoying of all video game enemies, bats. You have a gun, but limited shots. This is one of the best games on the collection, and I actually prefer playing it with a D-pad over the original Intellivision disc. The fifth game is 1983's Pinball. An impressive video pinball game for its time, with enough skill you can actually play on three different screens, but it can be tough to control. It's an okay addition. The sixth game is Princess Quest, a 2015 homebrew by Oscar Toledo Gutierrez, who has not only made some other great homebrews like Hoverbuffer for the Intellivision, which I reviewed in episode 491, but also wrote some programming books, including programming books for the Intellivision, which I also previously reviewed. Princess Quest is basically a Ghost and Goblin style game with different levels, weapons, and bosses. It's really impressive for the Intellivision and one of the best reasons to buy this collection. The seventh game is 1982's Shark Shark, another Intellivision classic where you eat fish smaller than you and avoid larger fish and try to nip at the shark's tail to take him down. This is one of those games where the original disc is better than a D-pad, but it's still a blast to play. The eighth game is 1987's Slapshot Super Pro Hockey. This game takes forever to play and the passing is basically too hard to use, as originally you used the keypad to direct your passes. Speaking of passing, I'm going to suggest most players pass on this one, at least in this collection. The ninth game is 1981's Snafu, a classic game where you try to trap the other players by wrapping around them, and while it's kind of okay as a single player, it plays better with two. The 10th game is 1986's Thin Ice. Try to make boxes around the other penguins while avoiding the seal and polar bears. It takes some getting used to as your line disappears with enough movement, but it's still a fun little title. It also included some instructional graphics that were kept out of the original release to save memory space. That's a nice little bonus. The 11th game is 1986's Thunder Castle, a true hidden gem on the system and one of my favorite maze games of all times. You avoid the baddies unless you get energized by using items or touching special creatures 
others turning the tables. Some items you pick up can be saved for later use, unless you pick up another item. This is a game that all retro gamers should really try out at least once in their life. The last game is 1980's Word Rocket. You shoot letters trying to make words. It's terrible as a single player game, so you'll want a second player if you really want to get any enjoyment out of it. The game was also included as part of both the Electric Company Word Fun and Learning Fun 2, but in both cases it wasn't the only game on the cartridge making it being listed as its own game kind of cheap. This could have easily been replaced with another title. The emulation of the game seems solid to me, but I'll play clips of all the games at the end to let you decide for yourselves. Family Friendly Wise, the game received a Peggy rating of three. I'm assuming for ages three and up, with Thundercastle having some creepy graphics, but nothing else really to note. So what do I think of Intellivision Collection 1? As a fan of the system overall, I approve. The D-pad works well in most games and there's a decent selection of titles. While some are great games, games like Thunder Castle, Night Stalker, and Shark Shark really offer some solid entertainment value. But the true cherry on top is Princess Quest. Including high quality homebrews in collections like this is really smart and gives retro gamers like myself something new to explore. Yes, using the keypad is a small pain when needed, but overall it wasn't too much of a problem. And overall, I ended up having a lot of fun with this one, especially with Princess Quest and Thunder Castle. You also get a decent value at $20, as buying a loose copy of Thunder Castle can currently set you back $30, and Princess Quest is no longer available for retail sale, with the last complete copy selling on eBay for over $130. So where am I going to rank the Intellivision Collection 1? I'll give it an edge over Namco Museum 2 at the 4 position, but I do like the beat em up action of Technos Arcade 1 a little bit better at 3. So out of the 11 Evercade cartridges I reviewed so far, Intellivision Collection 1 is debuting at the 4th position. Intellivision Collection 1 features some good classics and an excellent homebrew. But that's just what I think. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Also, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. Join the Discord. Support the show at patreon.com slash gamer and click the bell so you don't miss any future videos. Thank you for giving me a little part of your day and look forward to seeing you next time on the next episode of the No Swear Gamer. Take care, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.